thank you very much, Judy. Um, and I, I'd just like to start by thanking um, the, uh, the uh, people who run the fellows program and the, the, uh, the other fellows. It's really been an opportunity of a lifetime for me to interact with uh, the other scholars in such diverse fields this year. Um, so, um, so the subject of my talk today has to do with the ways that genetic information is processed in living cells. Um, and as Judy mentioned, it turns out that it's processed by machines, machines so tiny that they are made up of individual molecules. Um, and so in my talk today, I'm going to, um, I'm going to just remind you a little bit um, about how the flow of genetic information in live cells happens. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick as an example one particular molecular machine that's responsible for part of this process and tell you a little bit about not only about what we've discovered about how it works, but about how we're able to study such tiny machines in the laboratory. Um, and at the end of my talk, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about why we think this kind of research is important and what it can be used for in the future. So the biological world is a, is a fascinating and beautiful place. Um, the, um, the diversity of plants and animals that we see around us is a major theme in the biblical story of creation, and it's something that's fascinated visual artists and authors for centuries. Um, when the first light microscopes were, were um, discovered and started to be used by biologists, people quickly found out that this incredible diversity of different forms of life um, is recapitulated at the microscopic level. So the, the, the early microscope users discovered this fantastic and bizarre um, uh, variety of different forms of microorganisms. Um, and when we, and, and that we see the same sort of diversity when we look at the cells in the human body. There are many different kinds of cells in the body seeming with, with, with different shapes seemingly specialized for different biological functions. But when we go to even smaller size scales, when we go below the level of individual cells and we start to look at um, the molecules that make up cells, um, we start to see something different. Um, we now know that at the core of cells, there is a fundamental system of molecules and that that system is universal. That is, it is true for every living cell in every organism on this planet. Um, this is that system. Um, it's the system by which genetic information is encoded and processed in individual molecules. And so I'll just remind you of a little high school biology now. So you all know that genetic information is stored in DNA. DNA is this long string-like molecule, which I'm just showing you a little piece of here. It's made up of, of four building blocks indicated by the pairs of colors here called base pairs. And the genetic information is encoded in the sequence of those building blocks, which building block is present at which particular position in DNA. And in human cells, there is a lot of genetic information. There are six billion base pairs of DNA. And so, and, and a consequence of that is that even though um, the DNA uh, in, your cell, in your cells and the DNA in the person who's sitting next to you, the sequence of building blocks is more than 99% identical. Um, that fraction of 1% that's different is enough to ensure that your genetic information is different from the genetic information of the person sitting next to you unless that person is your identical twin. And it is, in fact, different from every other one of the 7.5 billion people in the human population. Um, so, and of course, the DNA in all of your cells is identical. And the reason that it's identical 
is due to this process indicated by the circular arrow here. We all started out as a single fertilized egg cell, which divided and divided and divided again. And with every cell division, a copy of the DNA molecules uh, is made, preserving the genetic information, and one copy is passed to each of the progeny cells. Um, so, um, and, and I'm highlighting this arrow because this, the process that this arrow represents is an information processing process. It's a simple process. It's just copying, the, it's just taking the genetic information in one DNA molecule and making an identical copy of it. But it's an information processing process nevertheless. Um, the same thing is true of, of the processes that use the genetic information, which are illustrated um, down here on the slide. Um, the, the DNA in our chromosomes is divided up into short segments, which constitute genes. And for the genetic information to be used, the first thing that happens um, is, that, is that cells take each gene and, and they, now make a cop they, they now make a copy of the genetic information in that gene that is realized in a new kind of molecule that's very similar to DNA, RNA, like DNA, RNA has, it's a long string-like molecule. It has four building blocks. And, and again, there is, a, there is an information transfer process that allows the cell to make many RNA copies of the same short segment of DNA to amplify the genetic information in the DNA. And, um, and finally, the genetic information in some of the RNAs is converted into another long string-like molecule protein molecules, again, making many copies from a single, single RNA. Um, the information processing here is a little bit more complicated, but only a little. And that's because proteins have 20 building blocks, not just four. But the sequences of, of these building blocks is encoded in triples of the RNA coding blocks. So. These information, so, so, so um, this scheme that I'm showing you on the slide, it resembles a, a computer program or the flow chart of a computer program. That is, it specifies um, that information is stored in, in a certain uh, physical form and that the information is transferred or copied into other physical forms. So what I'm showing you here is essentially software. It <laughs> illustrates the sort of program of the genetic information flow. Um, and like the software um, that, you use, uh, that you use on your phone or your computer, just having the software is not enough. To do any kind of real life information processing task, you not only need the software, you need the hardware that it runs on. And the hardware that this program runs on is the, is the molecular machines that carry out these, pilot, these processes that are represented by the highlighted arrows. So, um, so I'm, going to, I'm going to focus for most of my talk on one of these processes. And that's the process that carries out this step, the step that, take, that, that reads a segment of the DNA molecule um, that, that consists of a single gene and makes an RNA cop and builds an RNA molecule that contains a copy of that genetic information. Um, and so um, as, as, uh, as I indicated at the beginning of the talk, this process is carried out by a tiny molecular machine. And uh, this is the molecular machine here. Um, so so uh, here, I'll, I'll put a picture of it so you can see it better. There it is. So um, this is a molecular machine called RNA polymerase. It's, a, it's called that because it makes RNA polymers. Um, and, um, and, and of course, um, the real one isn't this big. Um, this, um, this, is a, this, was, uh, I, this is a, a 3D printed molecular model that was made by a Brandeis undergraduate, Eduardo Beltrame. And, um, and uh, this is a scale model. And so the real RNA polymerase molecule is made out of protein, not out of plastic. Uh, and it is uh, 15 million times smaller than this model. 
So it's small enough that it is way, way smaller than the smallest bacterial cell. And of course, it has to be because a whole bunch of these have to fit inside every cell. Um, and, uh, and just for, uh, just, so just to give you a feeling for the sort of scale of the process, this is a model of a DNA molecule printed to the same scale. Um, this DNA mo molecule model has 50 of the base pair building blocks of DNA. So this model represents a DNA that is actually far, far shorter than a typical gene. So, um, if, um, uh, so a, a typical human gene might have somewhere between 10 or 15,000 of the DNA building blocks. Um, so it's uh, so it's a thousand times the length of this of the one in this model, and uh, some of the longer human genes are 50,000 times the length of the one in this model. So if I tried to make um, a model on the scale of one of those large human genes, I could lay it down in, on Mass Avenue and it would stretch from Harvard Square to Central Square. And, and so you have to think about the, the, uh, the um, Herculean um, task that, that, that this machine has to accomplish. In, in some ways, it is like the little engine that could that Judy mentioned. Um, uh, you can imagine something of this size plunking itself down on the DNA in Harvard Square and moving along it all the way to Central Square, uh, generating, uh, a, a, assembling from its building blocks a new RNA molecule that contained a copy of the genetic information that's in the DNA. Um, and, 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 and for those long human genes, that, that process in the cell takes tens of hours to accomplish. Um, so, and, and, and ju just, just another thing, just to give you an idea of the size scale, um, this, if, you look, uh, if you look at this model close up, and I invite you to uh, come up afterwards and handle it, you can hold it in your own hands, um, you'll see that it's actually an agglomeration of little spherical shapes, and each one of those little spheres represents an atom, one of the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur atoms that make up the machine. So this is, this is a machine that performs this complex information processing process, and it's a machine that is so small that when you look at it, you can see the individual atoms of which it is composed. So we want to understand how this machine works. Can we look at it and tell how it works? Um, the answer is no. I certainly can't. And there, there, are, there are multiple reasons why merely looking at the machine does not tell us how it works. And, and one, of the, one of the most fundamental ones is that if we, um, if we looked at an automobile engine and took it apart, we might very well be able to infer, even if we didn't know very much about cars, we might very well be able to infer what some of the parts do. And that's because an automobile engine is made by human engineers with an intended purpose. Um, and, and human engineers tend to design things in a rational way where different parts perform different functions and they get assembled together. Um, this machine was not designed by human engineers. It was designed by this chaotic process, the process of random mutation and natural selection, which causes biological evolution. And, and um, that process works in very different ways than the rational thought processes of human engineers. And, uh, and so um, there aren't independently functioning parts of the machine. Um, it's um, very often, Particular functions aren't localized in particular parts of the machine, but they're distributed all over. And so, and so just the intellectual problem of, of understanding how it works is somewhat subtle and challenging. Um, there's another reason why we can't really, th th these structures are very valuable, but there's another reason why the structures alone are not sufficient to tell us how the machine works. And that's because the, um, the scientific methods that produce the information that's used to uh, build models like this, which I won't tell you about today, um, those methods produce a static snapshot of the machine. 
Um, and what these, what these proteins machines really do is highly dramatic, is, is highly dynamic. There's a great deal of movement of the different parts of the machine. And, um, and the understanding that movement is essential to understanding the operation, and we can't get it from a static picture. Um, so these, as I say, these machines are tiny. When we go into the lab, it's no problem for me to put in a little teeny test tube a tiny drop of liquid that does not just contain billions of copies of this machine. It's easy to make one that contains billions of billions of copies. Um, but, um, and if we, uh, if we put, if we also put DNA into the machine and the building blocks of RNA, we can get the machine to make RNA in the test tube. Um, one of the fundamental problems that we face in studying a system like that is that in this large population of molecules, the different molecules are doing different things at the same, at the same time. Every molecule is in its own distinct phase of the cycle through which the machine makes an RNA. Um, and, and unfortunately, the tools that, uh, that, that chemists and biochemists use to study syst large systems of molecules are such that usually what they do is they tell us about some property of, of the sample averaged over all of the molecules in the system. And that creates a great deal of difficulty in interpreting the data in terms of the operations of these, of these uh, biological machines. Um, it's, um, it's, it's as if you were confronted with a, uh, with a uh, crowd of very excited Red Sox fans. Um, so um, th here's a group of excited Red Sox fans. The Red Sox just won the World Series. They're far too excited to like chant anything in unison. And so if we try to understand what the crowd is saying um, all together, it's hopeless. We just hear. Um, so if we if we want if we wanted to really understand what they're cheering, the only the only way we could conceivably do this is to somehow focus down on the individual members of the crowd one at a time. You know, then we can, <laughs> we can understand what they're saying. And, and we can not only understand what they're saying, then we could, we could go to a different member of the crowd and we could ask if they were saying the same thing. Yay, Red Sox! Um, and and we could, there might be somebody else who was sort of conveying the same general idea in a different way. Um, and, and there could be somebody who was saying something completely different. Ball game over! Yankees win! Um, and, so, and so it's the same thing with our molecules. What we really need to do is we really need a way to look at the molecules one at a time so we can build up kind of a representative picture of the way the molecules function. But if we have to look at them all at once, we're kind of lost. And this might seem like kind of an obvious point. And the reason that I'm emphasizing it is that up until a little bit more than 25 years ago, it was not possible to do experiments where we could actually look at these individual molecular machines one at a time and study their function. Um, but, um, but, at, at a, uh, but at about that time, um, I and, and, uh, and several of the other investigators in the field started to work out ways where we could actually narrow down on the functioning of individual molecules. And, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those experiments now. And I'm going to start by telling you about the very first one of those experiments, just because it sort of sets the stage and, it, and, it, and it's relatively easy to understand. Um, and there's a, there's a before I tell you about the, the experiment, there's a physical phenomenon that you need to understand so, to understand how the experiment works. Um, and that's the phenomenon of Brownian motion. So um, if you, uh, if you uh, take uh, any kind of a collection of tiny microscopic objects that are floating around in liquid, and you look at them in a light microscope, you, s you see something that looks like this. So you see this kind of random chaotic motion. 
Um, now, I want to I want to emphasize that what you're seeing there's nothing living in the sample that you're looking at right now. This is just a a video taken through a light microscope, and the only thing that's in the in the sample is water and a collection of equally sized microscopic plastic beads made out of the same kind of plastic that styrofoam drinking cups are made out of. Um, and, and so there's nothing alive here. We're not supplying any kind of energy. But, but, and yet all of these objects are moving. And this is called Brownian motion. It's named after Robert Brown, an, uh, an English botanist who, who observed the same kind of motion uh, in, in, in the movement of microscopic pollen grains that he observed under the microscope. Um, um, and we know exactly what is causing this motion. And the reason why we know it is because of this guy, Albert Einstein, who, um, for his PhD thesis um, showed that you actually expect this kind of motion just based on physical first principles. And to understand what's going on here, I'll show you a modern computer simulation. So this yellow circle represents the bead, and the, the small black dots represent water molecules, which are floating around here. But of course, you can't see them because they're too small. And um, the water molecules are exhibiting this chaotic random motion, and that's just the that's just because this sample is at a temperature above the absolute zero of temperature. So the random motion of water molecules is the thermal kinetic energy of the water molecules. And at any given instant time, at any given instant in time, water molecules are colliding with the beads at all sides at random. But there's a statistical effect here where at any given instant in time, slightly more water molecules might collide with the bead on one side than collide with the bead on another side. And that gives the bead a little random push in one direction. And, um, and what you're seeing here is, is the residual statistical variation um, where, the, where the water molecules colliding on all sides don't quite even out. OK. So now back to the molecular machines. So um, I'm, I'm going to show you um, a movie of, of an experiment um, in which uh, I and my collaborators, um, Mike Sheets, Bob Landick, and Dorothy Schaefer um, did uh, quite a long time ago. Um, what we did was we, um, we, took, um, we took an RNA polymerase molecule. We let it, we let it move down a DNA making an RNA, and then we made it stop by taking away the building blocks of the RNA so that it gets stuck and it can't move. Um, and then what we did was we attached the RNA polymerase molecule to a glass microscope slide so it's fixed in position. And at the other end of the DNA, we put one of these microscopic plastic beads, the same kind of bead that I showed you in the last slide. And when we look at a sample like this, we see the following. Okay, so each one of these uh, each one of these little dots is one of the microscopic beads. They're exhibiting the same kind of random motion that I showed you in the previous slide, but here the random motion is subtly different. They're not just wandering around randomly. Instead, they're just sitting in one place and jiggling randomly. And of course. The reason for that is that these are beads on a leash. The DNA molecule is flexible, and so the beads can move around, but they can never go too far. So now, the, what I've showed you before, again, the RNA polymerase is stopped. It's not doing anything because we haven't given it the building blocks of RNA. But now we can throw those building blocks in. We throw in these, these chemicals, nucleoside triphosphates, that are used to construct RNA. and um, and then, and, I'll, and it, in the next slide, I'll show you one of these beads and what happens with time. So at the beginning, you notice that bead in, the, bead in the center is jiggling rapidly. But as time goes by, you'll see the amount of jiggling gradually gets less and less and less until in another few seconds, it'll be barely moving at all. OK. And of course, what's going on here is shown here. The bead started out on a long leash, but in this experiment, now we've given it the ingredients for RNA. 
the RNA polymerase is making RNA and moving along the DNA. But here, the tail is kind of wagging the dog. We've stuck the RNA polymerase to the surface. And so now the DNA has to move through it. And as the DNA moves through it, the leash gradually gets shorter and shorter. And we see the effect in the movie. So um, this movie is not going to win any Academy Awards for Best Documentary. There's kind of no plot. Um, and, no, and certainly no character development. Um, but uh, but when, we, um, when we made this movie, I and my collaborators were incredibly excited because we realized that for the first time, we were actually able to see an, indivi an individual one of these molecular motors moving along DNA, or at least see the effects. And by measuring the amount of wiggling of the bead, we could monitor the, we could, we could essentially deduce the position of the RNA polymerase on the bead. And from that, we could learn a great deal, we, we could and did learn a great deal about, um, the, about the effects of different sequences in the DNA on the movement, on, on, on different, um, the effects of uh, different signals in the DNA that control the movement of the polymerase, um, what kinds of forces the polymerase could exert on the DNA, and other, uh, and other things. Um, but um, this is a long time ago. So now I want to kind of fast forward to the present and tell you about the kinds of experiments that we do nowadays to learn more about how these machines operate. And, um, and these experiments are motivated by the fact that uh, they're, 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 they're motivated by wanting to overcome a limitation of this kind of experiment, which is that here we're really only looking at one aspect of the system. We're just studying the position of the polymerase on the DNA. And these, uh, these biological systems are quite complex for reasons that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, we want to be able to look at uh, we want to be able to look at more than one of the molecules that's involved, and our solution to that is to use color. So um, here's an experiment that was uh, that was done relatively recently by my colleague Larry Friedman, and um, what Larry did was he did the same sort of experiment. He took a glass microscope slide. This time, he attached the end of a DNA molecule to it. And the DNA molecule has attached to it a single molecule of a blue-colored dye, so that when we look in a fluorescence microscope, we, we can see a little spot of blue fluorescence from the DNA. Um, and then, and the, the nice thing about this technique is that then we can take, the, we can use the same approach. We can stick dye molecules of different colors on each of the other molecules that's involved, and we can study the coordination of the different molecules as they operate. Um, so in this particular experiment, Larry had blue DNA molecules, and he looks in the microscope and he sees a bunch of blue spots, and each one of those spots represents a single DNA molecule. Um, and then in solution, he could put RNA polymerase that's labeled with a yellow dye molecule. And then when he looks at the same area of the microscope slide, but now looking at the wavelengths of light that correspond to the yellow fluorescence, he sees a series of yellow spots. And sure enough, those yellow spots line up with the positions of blue spots, showing him that the RNA polymerase molecule has come down and it's bound to the DNA and it's gotten ready to make an RNA copy of the DNA. And then when Larry feeds in the building blocks of RNA, um, he, he adds this red labeled molecule which binds to and, and helps us detect the RNA. And he sees red spots and those overlay with the, with the yellow spots. And so here what we've done is now we're watching the whole molecular process that's involved in manufacturing the RNA. We're watching the, um, we're watching the DNA, we're watching the RNA polymerase, and we're watching the production of the RNA. And, uh, and, and this is just a movie of this experiment. So here, um, the squares mark places. So, so you're, showing, you're seeing two copies of the exact same area of the surface of the slide. But one is imaged at the wavelength that corresponds to where the RNA polymerase molecules are. One is imaged at the wavelength that corresponds to where the RNA molecules are. And so you can see that at the beginning, we start to see RNA, RNA polymerase molecules appear. 
uh, at different places. They appear and disappear. This turns out to be real, so not all associations of the RNA polymerase make an RNA. But gradually, um, we see the gradual accumulation of RNA spots at the locations where an RNA polymerase molecule has made an RNA. And um, we've learned a lot from experiments like this about, uh, about, the, uh, about the factors that control when an RNA is made from a gene and when it's not made. Um, so, um, so, you know, the, the picture that emerges from experiments like this is sort of illustrated by this animation where, uh, where the RNA polymerase in green is moving along the DNA in pink and it's uh, spewing out the RNA copy of the, of the uh, of the genetic information in yellow. And uh, in this movie, these little yellow spots that are flying around are supposed to represent the building blocks of, that are being assembled by the RNA polymerase into a mature RNA molecule. And this, and so this is animation is fun to watch, but it's wrong, okay? And uh, in, in several ways. One, one of the ways that you already know um, if this was a realistic animation, um, on this scale, these molecules would be undergoing absolutely wildly chaotic Brownian motion. In fact, the smaller the molecules are, the more chaotic the Brownian motion is. Um, and, and so this smooth motion is a complete fiction. And actually, the task that a machine like this faces is not so much how to move along the DNA because movement at this scale is absolutely ubiquitous. The, the, what the machine has to do is to control the movement so it moves unidirectionally. The other thing that's unrealistic about this movie is the fact that RNA polymerase and DNA and RNA are the only molecules that are shown here. And, um, and uh, it is, of course, true, I already told you, that you can take a test tube and put RNA polymerase and DNA in the building blocks of RNA, and you can make RNA in that test tube. But that's not the way RNA gets made in the cell. So, um, um, in the, um, so RNA polymerase, just like your car, comes along with a lot of accessories. And, um, and um, un unlike your car, the accessories aren't built into the machine. The accessories are just kind of floating around in the cell, and they interact with RNA polymerase at random. Um, and those accessories are very important because they control all sorts of processes in the cell. So here's a simple, this is a simple example, okay? So um, this, this, shows, uh, this shows the, um, the uh, the accessory proteins that are present in the simple intestinal bacterium, E. coli, um, that are involved in controlling the movement of RNA polymerase as it moves along the DNA. So the RNA polymerase is floating around in the cell. These accessory proteins are floating around in the cell. We know a lot about what the individual accessory proteins do, um, but what what um, scientists so far have been unable to figure out is how they collectively function together to modulate the behavior of the RNA polymerase. And that's simply because in the, in the systems where you're looking at many molecules at a time, it's too complicated to, to discern what's going on. Um, but now, because we can do these single, ex these single molecule experiments with proteins where with individual proteins each labeled with a different color of dye, we can start to learn um, about, um, about how these protein works. And so here's an example of an experiment like this. Um, so this is the same sort of experiment here. We've got DNA on the surface. We've got RNA polymerase labeled with a red dye so we can see where the DNA molecules are. Um, at the beginning of the experiment, there, we, we haven't made any, sorry, the RNA is labeled with the red dye. So at the beginning of the experiment, there's no RNA after a little while, you know, a few seconds, we start making RNA. And, and um, what we've done here is we've taken one of, these, um, one of these accessory proteins, which goes by the euphonious name of GRI-B, um, and we've labeled it with a green dye, and we've watched the, um, 
We, we watch the, the uh, Grebe protein coming and sticking on the RNA polymerase for a little while and then leaving. Um, Grebe is an important protein in this bacterium. Um, um, it, it's a protein that the cell uses to solve a particular serious problem, which is that um, which is that RNA polymerase, every now and then, it's moving along, copying the genetic information in DNA, and it makes a mistake, and it sticks on the end of the RNA, the wrong RNA building block. And when that happens, it's a big problem because it jams up the works and the polymerase stops. And if nothing were done about, um, about that stop polymerase, it's a potentially fatal problem for the cell because the polymerase is sitting on a gene and it's blocking other polymerases from moving along the gene. And if, uh, and if nothing's done about that and the gene is an essential gene, the cell will die. Um, so Grebe is the proofreading protein. Um, what it does is it comes along and um, some people had previously thought that it rides along with the polymerase all the time but we couldn't figure out how that could possibly be because it would interfere with some of those other proteins binding to the polymerase. Some people thought that GreeB had a way, somehow a way of sensing from a distance whether the RNA polymerase had made a mistake and only came up to interact with those, those proteins that needed proofreading. Um, but what this experiment shows is that the Grebe protein is, is what one of my postdocs calls the helicopter parent of transcription factors. Um, that, that is, it works by a just checking mechanism. Um, you can see here's, here's the fluorescence from an individual, from, from Grebe molecules. And these, each of these little blips represent a Grebe molecule coming and sticking on the polymerase for just a second and then leaving. And, and uh, what Larry Tetone, uh, my, my PhD student, was able to show in this experiment is that um, the Grebe comes and goes exactly the same way uh, uh, if, the, if the polymerase needs proofreading as if it doesn't need proofreading. So what it's doing is it's just coming in and checking periodically and fixing the problem if, if something needs to be fixed and otherwise it just Leaves and this um, and this uh, the, in in this way it can operate but not interfere with the other proteins that also have to bind to the RNA polymerase. So um, so um, here we're just looking at one protein, but now we've started to look at proteins in twos and threes, so we can see how they work together. Um, and as as I and Judy alluded to. Um, this process is made possible um, by uh, microscopes that we've built at Brandeis that have the unique capability of being able to look at multiple colors of single molecule fluorescence at the same time um, very accurately so that we can, we can build up descriptions of the processes. Um, this, is, this is a picture of part of one of our microscopes um, where you can see you, th this microscope has four visible colored lasers. Um, red, green, orange, and blue, and a near infrared laser that you can't see. And so we could, uh, and so we're, we're doing experiments where we monitor four proteins at once, and we can potentially do more as we develop the technology. Um, and we really want to develop the technology um, because, um, because what I've told you about are just examples of very simple systems of of accessory proteins that regulate RNA polymerase. Here's a more complex example. Um, this shows the, each one of the circles um, in, this, in this diagram represents a gene or a set of genes in E. coli, and the red and green lines that connect them show the, the regulatory interactions. They show that this yellow protein switches on or off the protein that it's connected to with either a green or a red line. Um, and so, and these processes of switching on and off proteins are, uh, are central to biology. They are the processes that cause different genes to be turned on and off in different cell types so that muscle cells are different from nerve cells. They're essential to the processes by which cells respond to chemical signals in their environment and regulate their metabolism. Um, and these regulatory systems 
are the things that sometimes fail in diseases like cancer. Um, and so um, we're very interested in studying these, these regulatory interactions. There aren't enough colors in the spectrum for us to be able to study uh, all or even a large number of these proteins at the same time. But you notice that if you look at these individual nodes, that, uh, that many, of, many of the genes shown in blue are regulated by a relatively small number of these regulatory proteins. So we, we, can, we can hope to make some progress in understanding the mechanisms by which these regulation systems work. My lab has mostly worked on studying transcription in bacteria just because bacteria are a little bit simpler than animal and plant cells. And even though they're simpler than animal and plant cells, they're plenty complex and they could probably keep us busy for certainly for the rest of my career. Um, but um, uh, kind of kind of inspired by the opportunity at the Radcliffe Institute, we we were also trying to take a bold leap forward and transplant these technologies to use them to study the cells of higher organisms. And so, uh, in my project this year, I'm working with Grace Rosen, one of my students at Brandeis, and uh, and and my collaborators at Harvard Med School, Steve Burutowski and Wa Beck and Eugene Zhu, and and we are we're making quite a bit of exciting progress um, transplanting these techniques on, from simple bacterial systems and using them to study higher organisms. Um, and so, um, um, so I'll, 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 uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'll finish up the talk um, just by saying a little bit about why we're doing this kind of research and why I think it matters. Um, so I've talked to you today about these molecular machines whose operation is essential to the viability of all living organisms. And un understanding these, these networks of protein interactions like I showed you on the slide of the bacteria um, and how these machines work together to allow living cells to function is really one of the major intellectual challenges of current day biology. Um, it's, a, it's certainly a part of human nature to be curious about how, how life works. And, and I really hope that I've conveyed to you um, the tremendous excitement that I and other scientists feel now that we are making um, rapid progress on these challenges through the, these new kinds of experiments that allow us to directly observe the operation of individual molecules as they go about their business. Um, I, I want to emphasize, however, that this kind of research does more than just satisfy our intellectual curiosity. Um, I'm a fairly old guy, and uh, during my lifetime there have been enormous advances in our ability to treat disease and fight infection. Um, and these advances, they are things that do not come about in isolation. Instead, most major advances in these areas of medicine um, were built on a foundation of basic knowledge about biology, exactly the sort of knowledge that's produced by research projects like the, of, of the type that I've been telling you about. Um, and, there, and there are particularly good reasons to think that today's research on cellular information processing mechanisms will help future advances in medicine, and, and maybe not even that far in the future. So even as I speak today, um, there are multiple drug companies, including a couple right here in Cambridge, who are starting early clinical trials on new types of drugs that are based on RNAs, that are, that are where they're actually administering to patients, or, or, to, or, or to, in this case, to, uh, yeah, they're clinical trials, so I guess they're giving them to patients already. Um, the, the, drugs that are that are based on modified RNAs that um, that that whose goal is to temporarily reprogram this, these information transfer processes um, to overcome infections and other kinds of diseases. Um, it's very it's very early days on these kind of medicines. We don't know yet whether these approaches will work. But the early results are sufficiently promising that 
these companies are investing some serious amounts of money into testing out these new therapies. And in, in the case of one of the companies, serious means $2 billion. Um, so, um, so despite the willingness of these drug and biotechnology companies to invest money when a product is in sight, they are not, in general, able to put money into research like the work that I've described, um, research that aims to increase the basic foundational knowledge of the field. And the reason for that is very simple. It's impossible to predict when this kind of research is being done what its applications will be you know, three or five or 10 years down the road. Um, so, that, if, so, so if we left the funding of that kind of research to drug companies, as has been proposed by some, um, we, would, uh, we would lose out on this kind of basic foundational knowledge. Um, the, this kind of research would barely happen at all were, not, were it not for a collective decision that's made by you and me and our fellow citizens, both here in the United States and in many other countries, to invest our a small fraction of our tax dollars into supporting this kind of basic research, which contributes to the common good. Um, and and I, I feel extraordinarily fortunate to live in a society where that decision has been made um, and, and where people take this kind of enlightened view of basic research. And, and I, I try to remember that every day that we go into the lab. Um, Thank you so much for coming this afternoon, and I welcome the opportunity to hear what you have to say. And I